I'm from Singapore. It's a very uh, hot place. So it's uh, summer every year. Right now it's about 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, so it's a, a big crunching for me. Uh, so this talk uh, will be separated into two parts. So uh, in my part, I will talk about what we're doing right now uh, and uh, a project uh, in Singapore. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's about a, a, a 8 million project, uh, Singapore dollar. Uh, one US dollar is about 1.3, 1.4 Singapore dollar. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big project. So I will talk about what we are doing right now and Phil will talk about uh, the future, you know, what we are going to do uh, later. Okay, so that's the topic, towards the glass is free 3D displays. Uh, so in our lab, we, we, you know, we, we do a lot of things. So display is, is one part. So, uh, but we have one theme, okay? The theme is called energy photonics. So uh, we, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a catchy word that, uh, you know, climate change. So we, we, we summarize this theme to combat the climate change. So this is uh, energy photonics. So explanation about this. So efficient energy transfer between photon and electron is a bit far from what we're doing the signal processing, but uh, uh, it's, it's more uh, on the fundamental, more fundamental level. Uh, so in this theme, what we, one of the topics we're doing is the low power and high quality displays. So 3D uh, is characterized in this, in this part. Okay, this is very important because uh, uh, low power you know, especially it's important because every, every, uh, you know, every person, as long as you are alive, there will be this place working for you throughout your life, okay? So imagine, uh, you know, one panel costs how much powers, you will consume a lot of powers uh, just purely uh, used for this place, okay? Uh, power is one thing, okay? And the next, another thing is that we have to maintain the quality, okay? So that's why we call it uh, low power, but high quality displays. So we also have uh, the Society for Energy Photonics, which I, I funded uh, uh, in Singapore to promote the research in this area. So this is uh, the outline, roughly. Uh, so uh, I will give a very brief introduction and we talk about the various uh, displays that we are working right now in the lab, including the tensor display, the steering backlight, uh, 3D, uh, super multi view, and we, we also uh, use some 3D films, lenticular films for mobile devices, and making use of that to make some floating uh, image displays. Uh, display is very important uh, it, it, because the future is di display centric. Be because no matter uh, uh, where we are, no matter when it is the time, you know, uh, uh, including everything, everybody, and for all every purpose, okay, we, we are talking uh, around the display, okay. So this, is, this, is, this image is uh, taken uh, uh, in 2013 uh, SID uh, symposium, it's uh, uh, Samsung CEO, his, uh, his presentation. So the future is the display-centric world, okay. Uh, and, okay, naturally 3D will be, be the future because uh, our eyes, uh, you know, will see naturally 3D things in 3D, okay. Uh, this is just some of the, uh, uh, what we think the, the future requirement for 3Ds, okay. You, we would to have less crosstalks, like, like you can see from A, and, um, uh, uh, and, and you know, this, uh, there are three different kind of uh, requirement, the essential requirement, advanced requirement, and ultimate requirement, okay. Um, uh, we should get rid of the, the, the AC conflict, okay, accommodation convergence conflict. We should uh, uh, generate the so-called uh, super multi-view, uh, like the C shown here, that uh, uh, when the view is very narrow and filled with the whole space, uh, then we'll, it, 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 it's the same like a light field display, okay. Um, and of course, the ultimate uh, uh, expectation will be similar like the D, you can generate a, a a very large uh, viewing zone, okay, uh, filled with so many fine, uh, discrete uh, views. I, I can see that a lot of uh, uh, demos have shown that, that like uh, uh, Holographica, uh, you know, they are all trying to go into this direction. But another thing is that I feel we, we need to make it 
cheap enough to, to, for people to be able to afford to buy it. Um, so one of the, the display we do is a tensor display. So this, we, we use the multi-layer LCDs to stack them together. Um, um, okay, of course we need the source. So this is uh, just showing that the five by five uh, sources through the computation uh, 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 optimization, we, we are able to, to generate uh, a good, a reasonably, good, reasonably good 3D. So this is what we have done. Uh, uh, so those 25 images are, are viewing basically for the light field optimization, optimization zone. But there are other zones which are not optimized. So, so what we do is to add a weightage factor to optimize uh, uh, this these other rooms as well. So this is a displaying effect. So without doing the optimization for the other zones and with the uh, optimization of the other zones. Um, these are some of the, the videos that we have done. So this is for, for a, a car. This is from the MIT's uh, uh, database. Uh, you can see this is for a still image. Uh, Okay, we also uh, did some, uh, uh, you know, for the, the motion, uh, motion image, but, but as you can see, a lot of, uh, still a lot of uh, artifacts uh, generated. And because this need a lot of computation power, so we use GPU, but uh, it's uh, for this simple uh, um, um, image, uh, but for my very complicated image, uh, we still uh, cannot do it. Uh, the next is uh, steering 3D display with eye tracking. So this was uh, previously uh, a European product done by Phil in, in UK. So this is a setup. Uh, so we have uh, the projector here, which is uh, the, the light source. And uh, uh, it will be, uh, uh, you know, generate the, the backlight pattern. Uh, uh, by those uh, array of uh, lenses, then this will be fit into the LCD screen uh, for, for left and right eyes, okay? So what we have developed further is that uh, with uh, Kinect uh, eye tracking uh, and also with, uh, with a 3D uh, camera and uh, in situ capture the object. So when the viewers are, are viewing uh, around the display, so the Kinect sends the, the viewer's motion and uh, and, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, changing the position of the, the capture. So it is on a track. So we, we actually seeing the different perspectives of that uh, object being captured. So this is just uh, sh showing that uh, 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 the left and right eye, uh, you know, images. One is red, one is green. So we can see that's not so much crosstalk. And this bottom image shows that uh, uh, there is a, a small toy over there. The viewer is uh, viewing that small toy. So when he look, changes viewing directions, actually the capture is in situ. It will show later on that uh, uh, it is uh, the, the the camera is moving on a track to to look at different perspectives of that, that object. So, so over there, that uh, uh, camera is, uh, is rotating, uh, corresponding to the position of the, the, pers the, the viewer. OK, another thing that we have developed uh, is, is the so-called super multi-view. So, uh, so in this case, we have to employ the so-called spatial temporal multiplexing because uh, we, we, we basically the, the resolution is, uh, is not that high. We cannot uh, you know, uh, sacrifice too much on that. So we have to apply the temporal multiplexing together with the spatial multiplexing to generate the super multi-views. Okay. So uh, to do that, what we, we intend to do is uh, with the monitor plus the lenticular lens which that will sacrifice the spatial resolution, and then we plus a steering screen, so that will give us the temporal uh, multiplexing. So this is uh, the basic principle. So basically, we want to generate very narrow views, 
as narrow as, as the half of our pupil size. In this way, we will be able to overcome the AC conflict completely. So, so I think Phil will, will further mention on this. Uh, so this is what we have. We, we use the existing uh, ASUS uh, 144 hertz monitor. This is what we have, uh, fast dis uh, display monitor on the market. So uh, we arrange the pixels in this way. And uh, 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 it, will, it will give us uh, 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 three times of temporal uh, multi, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we need three times of temporal multiplex, okay, to, to, to generate uh, nine views. So this will give us uh, three view, um, three basic views, and then we'll add in uh, six uh, uh, temporal views. So totally it will have nine views. So this is uh, under development. As you can see, this is uh, uh, with, with a, a lenticular lens screen that we can uh, generate all these uh, nine, uh, uh, nine views according to that. Uh, this is a steering screen, just a, just, just a demonstration of uh, steering that uh, uh, images. But again, they will have uh, uh, still a lot of you know, a long distance to go to make it a, a real demo. Uh, so another thing which is more close to the market is a lenticular lens type of displays. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, uh, working with a company. We have uh, five view uh, 3D films uh, put on iPhones, put on this iPad, those kind of uh, uh, smart displays, uh, mobile displays. Uh, so this is this is uh, the, the the film. Uh, uh, it's 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 not bad when you, because uh, the handphone right now they have very high resolution. So even if you lose some spatial resolution, you still feel it's uh, it's very good. Um, so making use of that, we we just uh, uh, you know make some very uh, simple optics. Uh, you know, the student tried to play, uh, made some, uh, you know, so-called uh, uh, floating 3D. Basically, uh, you look at the display uh, from the front and you, you steer it uh, from the side. You'll see the side uh, image of this uh, dancer and then you go back and see the back. Okay, so it, it, it's all around. Uh, okay, so, so that's, that's all of my part, so I will invite uh, Phil. And I'm bringing him, so. <laughs> so, so, so this project is supported by, uh, uh, by National Research Foundation uh, of Singapore and uh, especially thanks to, to Phil because uh, you know, he is uh, uh, the key person working on this project and we also have a few other guys uh, listed below. I'll just go briefly through um, our project is the our remit is to produce a glasses-free uh, 3D. So we decide there's sort of three basic ways we can do it. So computational multi-layer, that's the uh, uh, based on the MIT system, uh, head tracked, and super multi-view. Well, I'll gloss over the first ones, I think, because Shaway's already covered that. So he's shown this already. Um, so I think what's of particular interest here is the super multi-view. Now, Currently, most super multiviews are based on the sort of holographic principle with, say, multiple projectors and a vertically diffusing screen. Um, as you can see, they're very large, and what we want to do is can we compress this into something, say, less than a centimetre deep? That's quite a challenge. So, first thing we have to do is we haven't got the luxury of vertical parallax. So that's, you know, although it's nice to have it. Um, we're, we're into displays and we just can't do it. So there's no arguments about this. Um, so the idea is that we, instead of having these massive great structures, we can compress the whole thing so every pixel will be a tiny projector that can give it a different beam of light in different vertical directions. So that's our aim. So. What I'd say is, um, we talk about super multi-view, and that's a multi-view with a large number of views. Well, my contention is that really, um, what is the difference between 
integral imaging or, say, light field display and a multi-view with a very large number of views. Because if you look, the image region, the light blue region, is close to the screen. Now, you get better depth if you've got high angular resolution. Well, that relates to number of viewing zones. If you've got a, a super multi with a large number of viewing zones, say 100 or more, that represent, represents a, really a light field display. And I don't believe there's any difference. So we can produce lots of views. We've got a light field display in effect. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about this. Sorry about that. Um, so I think um, depth in a 3D display is all down to angular resolution. That's what we need to achieve, high angular resolution. So I'll just turn this off so it's my wife phoning. Um, so it's just an example. You can see that as the number of views goes up, um, the dark region represents so the usable area of the viewing region. So as the number of views goes up, you see that your viewing space comes way out of the screen. The current, say, eight or nine view displays, you see the depth that can come out of the screen is very small. And I don't think that's acceptable. I think we need to have proper depth. So, I mean, we do need a large number of views. And the way I look at it in sort of intuitive sort of way is that you've got effectively like voxels formed by the crossing of these, if you like, we've got discrete images here. I mean, it won't be quite like that in practice. So the further you come away from the screen, these voxels get longer, effectively. So this sort of intuitive way of saying, well, the more views, the more depth we can come out of the screen. So this is interesting. We got this from TP Vision. Um, a couple of years ago, they gave us this information, the effective depth of field of a, this is a nine view display. So you, you start off with a 4K display, and you make it into a, a nine view with a slanted lenticular. So straight away, you're down to about 1300 effective pixels across the screen. So there's your loss, your, your spatial loss to start with. As you come out from the screen, say, up to 300 millimetres, which isn't a great deal. Your resolution drops to about 300, so that is really crap depth of field. So this is why I think manufacturers, I mean, with 4K displays, manufacturers could produce slanted lenticulars, but it's not done. And I think they don't perceive these being good enough to serve the public in a, for a consumer product. And um, here's the effect. This is taken from Atanas's um, thesis. But this shows the effect of, um, if you like, the low spatial or angular resolution of um, a multi-view display. You get these multiple edges formed. That effectively gives you a blurred image as you come away from the screen. These edges get further and further apart, so that's how it affects current multi-view displays. And Shava said, um, you know, we, we need the high angular resolution, the large number of views. Whether we can ever achieve this, you know, say two views per pupil, I'm not sure, but that's what we can aspire to, but the more views, the better. That's the way I look at it. And if you look at the plan of the viewing regions, it's taken from a Interesting, very good paper, this workshop on uh, 3D imaging. That your usable viewing region is shown by this dotted blue line. And when you're at the optimum viewing distance, you get, say, a separate image in each eye. As you come, say, forward or away from it, you'll actually see parts of more than one image, generally three or five images of, across the screen as you come further away from the optimum viewing distances. Um, so you get sort of image shearing across the screen, but the more views you have, the smaller the difference between these adjacent views. So there's another reason for choosing a high number of views in the display. So where we want to go is a spatial temporal multiplexing. You can't cram, say we need 100 million or more than that, um, pixels, you can't get all those onto a, a current display. So I think we've got to go to spatial temporal multiplexing. Now here's an example. If you wanted, say, integral imaging with sort of eight views across, so, and which doesn't give, oh sorry, 16 views across, doesn't give very good depth. But you'd need 256 pixels behind each lens. So you could then go to a 16 view full horizontal parallax, you'd need 
pixels arranged like that, that would still be very difficult. If you're going to say 100 views or more than 100 views, how physically are you going to make that? So the other answer is to have, say, pixel like this, that you can then address. I mean, you, you, this would be impossible to address, you know, the, the sort of parasitic capacities. You know, it would just be impossible. But if we can, I mean, this is where we're going to liaise with um, manufacturers. If we can get a, a fast display of pixels like that, we can effectively fill these spaces in um, with the steering screen that's mentioned earlier. So um, it seems a feasible way of getting a lot of views. So here's the steering screen. So what we have, this would be the example of a 16-view display. So we'd have these narrow viewing zones with gaps in between. So what we do is fill those in in time with the steering screen. So here's a, a, a very fast OLED display that we're going to get our hands on um, from a manufacturer in China. And we've got access right to the glass, so we can then run that thing fast. If you take, say, a um, display out of a phone, you can only run up to 80 hertz, and they, that's it. You're limited by the, the driver. There's chip on glass. There's nothing you can do. This way, we can, we've got a display that... Um, they say can run up to about a kilohertz. So we're now talking about serious temporal multiplexing. So just quickly, I'm taking a different approach to what's being done here. My idea is that we catch the images with a dense camera array. And this, um, you know, we've been forced by necessity to do this. So we've got a dense camera array. We apply a depth map to it. So here's our temporal multiplex. It's the time one you... You've got frame buffers, say four frame buffers, you, you write the whole buffer. Then with a the depth map, if you've got an image where, say, there's a, a sphere sticking right out in front of a background, all you do is update those areas. At time two, you update the bigger area. But the, the upshot is you don't have to update the whole of the frame buffer every time. So this way, um, by using a depth map, and it's a three-dimensional depth map. Um, so there's a depth map for each line. So here's, the, here's a view of three spheres. There's two planes for x, x, and y, y. So you get this depth map here. So what, being spatial temporal multiplexing, these regions represented by four could be, say, updated at um, fast refresh rate, say 240 hertz. These at just 60 hertz, for example. So the upshot of this is that you can actually um, compress the, you know, handling a lot less data, but in an absolutely lossless way. So, and you capture all the information. So what you do is reject it right at the camera output. So um, you don't have to handle any sort of larger amounts of information. That's a lot of time now. So that's how depth maps derive. So there isn't time to explain it now. We're running a bit short on time. Um, with the camera away, we can sort of program it so that we can do the, the depth of field, the convergence. This would be the idea. So with a fixed array of say inexpensive cameras, dense array, we can then operate on the images to effectively focus them or converge them. We can calibrate it that way. We can choose a depth of field by which cameras. We could say, choose things coming out of the screen, um, give them a high angular resolution so that they're sharp, anything behind the screen, then we can say, well, don't catch it on all the cameras. We can actually do it on the fly. So it's very flexible. Where this works out in the more well, for like subtle image processing methods, I don't know, but it's a practical approach for us because we've got the problem of having to build a display, a system. So our research basically is we've got the devices, which is a steering screen, which is difficult. We've got to steer fairly quickly a fast OLED, and in parallel that we're building a nine view, a very crude nine view system. So we're attacking sort of both sides of the problem. We're going to learn a lot just from this very um, crude nine view system where the depth map would just say something is near or far, but we'll learn a lot on the way from that. So that's my last slide. So.